Well, hey there, money nerds. Happy Monday. Normally here, you'd hear us rolling into an episode, but today got something a little different. We did an event last Tuesday that we called The Stack. And if you are not familiar with their YouTube channel, you'll want to go and subscribe because we're increasingly doing things like The Stack over there. Uh, YouTube.com forward slash Stacking Benjamins for that. And today we're going to play the audio. The whole thing was two hours long. We're going to edit it just slightly. The one thing that you won't hear here, but you may hear reference to, uh, our first guest does a live magic show for us. And obviously, sleight of hand tricks don't do that well on audio, believe it or not. I know, hashtag shocker. But we'll have nearly all of the rest of it for you. So without further ado, let's roll it, Steve. Here comes the stack. Stacking Benjamin's live event. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Lift off. Live from YouTube, welcome to the stack. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Welcome to a live event. So good. Well, I got to tell you, it's better than doom scrolling social media like I know you were doing all last week. Hey, everybody. I'm Joe Saul. See, hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And on tonight's big show, the woman whose book helped start a movement called The Fire Movement, our favorite philosophical book on money, say hello to Vicki Robin. Also, the star of a recent Million Stories Faceplant video. He's a guy with a PhD. He's a best selling author, a mentor, a motivation speaker and a guy who started all those things while he was in prison. Michael Santos is going to join us. Plus, Silicon Valley's hottest magician, the guy who does magic for billionaires, kicking off tonight's show. You're going to say hi to Mr. Dan Chan. But first, here he is, my co-host with the most. Everybody mash it on your keyboard right now. Say hello to O Jut 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 G. We, we don't need Doug. Do we need Doug? Uh, I thought we'd let him go. No, we didn't let Doug. Well, we, we, we did for send sure. him out for drinks tonight. We sent him out he's for on, drinks. He's we, on vacation. We told him we're starting an hour and a half from now, right about the same time that we're, that, that we're right. uh, actually ending. But how are you, man? Welcome to Tuesday. Another beautiful day. It's also the Marine Corps birthday today. It is the Marine Corps so, birthday. So November the 10th. Happy birthday, Marines. That's absolutely fantastic. Amanda, we got a great lineup tonight, don't we? Super excited. Yes. I got a favorite, but we're going to wait and see how that plays out. Yes. Let's let's talk about a few things before we get started, everybody. Okay. No, number one thing we have, and they're already talking about you without the bag. Believe it or not, he has a face. And it's gorgeous. <laughs> You often wonder why he has a bag and I don't have a bag. That's what, is, that's what uh, we wonder. Yeah. They're talking about your sweater vest already. I know. Isn't that cool? It is. It's, it's, it's great. It's better than the Nike t-shirt I had on in the, in the warm up. Right? Just, just a few I minutes ago. Hair, right. You know, put on a collared shirt and everything. Did you see, by the way, all those old logos that we had, all those. <laughs> it was like, what kind of show was that? It's like, we're a train wreck of old logos. Glory it's, oh, it's, it's, it's horrible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Should we introduce our co-host on this thing here? I think, yeah, we might as well. Yeah, let's do it. Tonight, guys, we have a couple fantastic co-hosts. My co-host on the greatest headlines-only show. She is my co-host six days a week there from Money With Friends. Say hello to Bobby Rebel. Bobby! And you are muted. And now you're not muted. Perfect. I've, I've, so do you, you control that, I do, which I think that is, this is, I did not know that my up. friends they set you up. Are you ready for some good stuff tonight, Bobby? You, I am very ready. Thank you for having me. This well, is awesome. And thank you to all the stackers that are having me here. Join you guys crush the party. We, so thank you. We have such a great time and I have to, to pull back the curtain a little bit. You were getting ready to go live with our money with friends show, uh, Monday morning. 
and you guys pivoted to talk about the stock market going through the roof, like in, in what, yeah. five minutes you changed gears yeah. in five minutes. Well, there was this little thing from Pfizer that had the futures up like 1600 points. And for those of you guys that, that don't know my background, I used to report literally from the floor of the New York stock exchange for years for Reuters. So, you know, I have a little familiarity with the stuff that's not normal. So, uh, yeah, we decided to talk about why the market was up so much. It, so yeah. it was, it was really cool. I, I hope it stays up forever. Right. OG. Yeah. I was going to say, you're welcome. I put some money in last, uh, <laughs> You know, in the pre-market on Monday, you guys are welcome. Wait, Don't spend it all in one place. It's 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 exactly oh, it. That's, that's how we move the market. F fantastic. Let's say hello to our fourth uh, host for tonight's festivities. He is a gentleman who is a two-time Plutus nominee, one-time Plutus winner, the man behind the Earn and Invest podcast, our friend Doc G, joining us tonight as well. Man, it's about time. Look at everybody else. Like Wait a minute. Bunch. Everybody else is dressed up and you're wearing a t-shirt and not even this with is your my dress up. Not even this with your current logo. When you invite me last to the party. This is how I come. <laughs> it's oh I see. No, it's about okay. If I would have been invited third, maybe I would have <laughs> wore some pants tonight. I don't know. How are you, man? Doing well, doing well. Just excited to be here. I'm really excited about the storytelling that's going to happen tonight. I just, I'm real excited to hear these guests. That's what, that's what I wanted to ask you guys about. Bobby, what are you most excited about tonight? I am most excited. I'm going to quote someone that, you know, makes a big impression in my life. I'm going to quote the bachelorette, Claire Crawley. <laughs> you showed up. The stackers showed up. And I'm so excited that everyone is here for it. I feel like, you know, the hibernation is over. I feel like the time out is over. We all had our time to do the bread baking. We, maybe some of us had some projects like making candles. I furnished a balcony. OG um, made a bunch of candles. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, you know, and we did the COVID, we, we all gained the COVID-19 and thank you to our listeners over at money with friends and stackers are welcome to join in for all of the hangover cures that they sent my way <laughs> during a certain phase. So we're ready. You guys showed up um, just like Claire said, the men showed up on the bachelorette and uh, I'm glad to be here with all of you. Doc, how about you, man? Uh, any, <laughs> any guests you're most excited about tonight? Yeah, so I'm excited about all of them. Michael Santos's story is just amazing. And I feel like we have been in hibernation. We have been doom scrolling. We've been paying attention to these elections. So to get some real just pure inspiration, I'm looking forward to it. I like how Kevin says, thank you, Bobby, for bringing credibility to, to, this, to, to, to this group. <laughs> to these jokers. <laughs> I'm missing, by the way, I just want you to know, not that I'm not taping it, but I am <laughs> taping, Joe, taping it. I am recording The Bachelorette. Well, you we can tell this. it's an important night. It's a, it's a very it important, is important night. OG, uh, what are you most excited about tonight? Well, I, I'm just going to say what everybody hasn't said, but really wants to say. The magic. I, I can't wait to see the magic. So whatever happens next, I'm here for the magic. Do you want um, you want the good news or the bad <laughs> or the bad news? Uh, well, I guess good good news. The good news. The good news? news is just like everybody hanging out with us right now, you're going to get to see a ton of magic because he's just oh, about perfect. to come out and do a fantastic show for us. Dan Chan is here waiting in the wings, but there's more. Can't wait. The, okay, hit me with it. The bad news is we're not going to have enough room on screen for you. So you get to go bye-bye right, uh, uh, well, right about now. <laughs> That's not, that wasn't in the contract. And He's there he goes. I'm so sorry. And Doc G, we'll see you later on as well. And ladies and melting, we're, we're going to see Bobby right back here in a second. But right I now, feel like I, I got the rose right now. I'd like to introduce <laughs> the 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 man who is not only Silicon Valley's greatest magician. He's got a phenomenal story, everybody, that I can't wait for you to hear. He also does magic for billionaires. We're going to ask him about magic and billionaires in a second. Let's say hello to the one and only Mr. Dan Chan. Hi. How are you, man? 
You dropped off for just a second. I was what, getting scared. Well, here's the weird thing is that for me to do this, I actually have to drop off so we get you in the main box so that we can see more of you than you can of Bobby and I, because we're just going to sit here and, 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 and watch the show. So, so you, you brought a show for us tonight. Absolutely. Uh, hi, Bobby. Hi. How's it going? Can I jump right into it, Joe? Absolutely. Let's go ahead and start, and then we'll ask you questions if you don't mind. Afterwards, uh, if you can stick around, we want to ask you some questions about your career and having to pivot and and doing magic for billionaires and all that stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, one of them actually called me minutes before I jumped on right here. (laughs) Really? So you got another gig. It looks like... uh, a big exec is uh, calling to do an event next week, so it looks looks very promising. Nice. So, uh, Bobby, we're going to start with you. I'm going to oh, no. sign a I was card afraid right of that. here. And we're okay. going to sign the card right here with a symbol, but I'm going to put a big B here for Bobby. Okay. But uh, give okay. me any random symbol. Um, a diamond. A diamond, okay. So I'm going to put a diamond right there with the big B, right? Right there? Now... Okay. We're going to start with the card face up. Don't blink, Bobby. (laughs) Give it a little bit of a rub, and the card just jumps to the top. Now, typically audiences go into spontaneous, unsolicited applause, but I'm going to leave that right there. (laughs) I think I have that button, Dan. And I would just push it in in a live show, and I'd show my hand emptied and reach right there and pluck it behind your ear. And we got a comment that said, Dan, you should be on uh, Penn and Teller's Fool Us. My son was just recently on Access Insider with Penn and Teller. Um, just recently. Yeah. You, w- w- I'm, I'm like, the, oh my God. <laughs> in the times when you could do that live with people, I, is that one of the tricks you would do where you you do it on somebody else's cell phone? I did a lot of things on cell phone, but a lot of what I'm doing right now, I created just for Zoom. Wow, okay or virtual performances. I've done about 170 corporate events on Zoom. um, And it's been an exciting journey. And since the pandemic, I've only done about seven live events. So I think this trend is definitely going to stay. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. They want your stock picks, by the way. You see that. (laughs) That's who our audience is. That's what they, you can tell we got a money geek audience. They showed up for your stock picks. (laughs) I've invested in all the companies that have hired me. Including Google, Neo. Yes. Uh, quite we a bit. know why, though. If people read up more about you, they'll they'll know why. It's actually a very smart reason. We can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, for the last effect, then we'll go into that real quick. Uh, Bobby, your thoughts determine your actions. Your actions determine your habits, and your habits determine your destiny. So it's important now more than ever to think of positive thoughts. L- look right into my eyes. Perfect. Okay. Name a person, place, or thing that evokes a positive thought or emotion. Joe Salcihai. J- Joe. My co-host. Yes. Joe. Now, we never discussed this prior to today, today correct? I didn't know what no. you were going to say. But I wanted no. to show you both. Right there, I wrote Joe. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Oh, my God. Of Joe. Oh, my God. Yeah. Someone send me the wine. (laughs) (laughs) How did he do that? That's fantastic, man. That was amazing. Amazing. Thank you. I can't, I can't even. Yeah. We we didn't even, I wasn't even there for rehearsal. (laughs) Like the technical rehearsal, you know, you guys do, we do like a technical check beforehand. I wasn't even there. I literally never even virtually met you before. That was so amazing. Can you spend some time talking about your career then? Yeah, I first started off uh, pre-IPO PayPal. I worked alongside, well, in the same offices as Elon Musk and Peter Thiel way early on in the early 2000s. Did you call him Pete? Did you call him Pete and E? No, I would run into them and I didn't realize how far my coworkers would go because they would start a lot of other companies, YouTube, many other companies in Silicon Valley. And I just wish I really kept in contact with most of them. Most of them. I ended up deciding that magic was going to be my thing and started running back into them at some uh, Silicon Valley parties. 
But did you, did you, well, let's bring OG on as well while we talk to you about, about your interesting career. Did you cold turkey make the switch or did you start doing magic part-time on the side and then, and then move in slowly? Like when did you decide that you were going to jump out of PayPal and do this instead? Yeah, I was taking some sick days to go to the dentist (laughs) (laughs) and I was actually taking, uh, you know, taking on gigs. So I was making as a family entertainer, 250 to $500 for a show, which wasn't bad. But when I started looking at it hourly, I was making more (laughs) doing magic. And I just hated being in that office. I would, I would remember trying to sneak off to play the video games and go to the ping pong table. So I said, this is definitely not for me. This is a this is a money show. So did you make sure you had like a runway, like a reserve of a few months that you could fall back on? Like, tell me about because you must have thought, what if it doesn't go? What if it doesn't go well? Yeah, uh, I was already making more on the weekends than I was on the weekdays. And I already had that lift that I needed. I think of a business in terms of like an airplane. You need to have some lift before you take off. And I was already taking off. So that's the only reason why I decided to uh, accept the fate of leaving. Yeah. So. Bo- uh, Bobby, you have a question? Yeah. You also, I was impressed. I did a little homework, um, as I do. You did a lot of market research before you took the, the leap as well. You really studied what the competition was doing, and you studied how to brand yourself to maximize what you could charge clients. Absolutely. I did a SWOT analysis, with, which is strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. And I also thought of it in terms of Porter's five forces. What does that mean? Explain that. Uh, Porter's five forces is just a, the framework for looking at how you can switch suppliers or how easy it is for people to um, give you different pressure. And, um, so it's just five different uh, ways to analyze your business. Gotcha. And what what did you think the threats were when you're doing your SWOT analysis? Because you must have come up with the fact that, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of entertainers out there. You're not just competing against other magicians. You're competing against a lot of entertainers. Yeah, the thing with magic, it's such a fun job. I know janitors, I know doctors, I know lawyers who do this as a side hustle. And those are some threats because, for example, the Raiders doctor is also a magician, believe it or not. And you've got so many. He makes the Raider wins disappear. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So those are some of the big threats that you are seeing because it's such a fun job. Who doesn't want to crash a party for, uh, you know, part time? So those are the threats that I analyzed. Yeah. The uh, OG. yeah, I was going to say, first of all, it was amazing. I, I, could, I could see the whole thing. And thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, uh, my son in particular is super excited about, about uh, magic. And I told him that we were going to be doing this. And, and so I know he's in the other room rewinding the YouTube thing going, I, I, I want to learn how to do this because it was just, uh, it was awesome. Tell us about the uh, billionaire magician tag and how, and how that came to be and, and uh, what the story is with that. Yeah, how you label yourself is really important. For example, I first started off as Dan Chan, the magic man, which is rhymes. There's the rhyme and alliteration. Those are both hypnotic. But then once I started going by Dan Chan, master magician, I started getting all the corporate events. But then I ended up performing for billionaires in Sun Valley, Idaho, in Germany, in Shanghai, in Las Vegas. So I just said, hey, I'm just going to claim that title. And that really worked out really well because we performed for over a hundred billionaires at, at different conferences. There you go. We, we did the conference where we saw Phil Knight and Oprah Winfrey at that conference. So it was, pre- it was pretty cool. You, yeah. you, you got your son involved in magic. Um, was it his choice or your choice that he started in the family business? Uh, I actually kind of forced him into the magic (laughs) at age four. I kind of forced him and we fought by age five. He was juggling three balls in the show by age eight. He was juggling five balls and three flaming torches by age 10. He was picking pockets and by age 12, he was on national television twice. Uh, So that was, um, (laughs) and, and once he hit age six, he stopped fighting with me. And since this is a money podcast, the thing that you'll find interesting is 
once he started making money, he never argued with me again. <laughs> it pretty much stopped. He made $120 in two hours with breaks, just street performing in, at Christmas at Union Square. So many years afterwards, he would always ask me, Dan, can, Dad, can we go to Union Square and perf- street perform during Christmas? I need to buy gifts for my... <laughs> uh, my uh, family and relatives and Mike Anderson. Yes. I performed at the magic castle in Hollywood. So just for you, Mike, if you send me an email, uh, I will hook you up with passes the next time you want to go. Oh, cool. Oh, and, and, and we know, uh, Mike was just a guest on the podcast as well. So for people that heard last Friday's show, he was uh, part of our round table, by the way, in just a second, we're going to have a couple more questions, everybody, uh, for Dan, but I know that you've got some questions for him too. We're going to take some of those. We've set aside about five minutes for your questions. So, uh, bring them. And as we see your questions, we'll, we'll take those. Um, initially, Initially, you must have, Dan, had to take just anything. I can imagine you out in somebody's backyard playing like a children's party, you know. Um, uh, how did you start targeting the types of events that you really wanted and being able to say no to stuff that you didn't want? Well, you start leveraging yourself and start marketing in the way that you want to be be perceived. So you'd always have walkway powder. Once you have one event in a week, you would raise your rates for the next one. So you'd always stay hungry. Gotcha. That's one of the things that I started doing was when you are too cheap, people don't want to buy that, believe it or not. So yeah. if, you, if you price yourself too low, you're going to lose a lot of business. But if you price yourself too high, you're also going to do the same. So I started giving people options. For example, I said, I'll guarantee an entertainer at your event. But if you want me, the price is a premium. So I would leave options open, which allows you to have leverage. And I think a lot of entertainers don't think about that. They're thinking, oh, I'm just going to take it. But what if my billionaire clients start calling me? Yeah. Then I have to pass that off. And I would uh, tell my regular clients, hey, I'll take this, but it's conditional. And that will also build my brand because next year, no matter how good you are, they're not going to always want the same magician, even if you're really good. So keeping them, you know, putting that seed in really helps. Oh, gee, I, I want to pause right there because what Dan's talking about, I think most people, especially when they're starting their side hustle, all they think about is how can I undercharge everybody else? And in, mm-hmm. in between our ears, we got all these reasons why we think we need to be have things based on price. And yeah. especially when you're new, you can't afford to do that. Well, and, and Dan, like you said, I mean, at the end of the day, you've got to figure out what your time's worth, and then and then also recognize that that there's some there's some premium uh, discrepancies there. Like you said, when you go to when you go to the grocery store and you've got a choice between you know something that's twenty five cents and something that's two dollars and fifty cents that says premium on it, you're going to assume that you get a better outcome from that or a better you know this can be a better thing and. And, uh, and as you continue to practice and build your team, I think that was the important lesson there is that, yeah. is that uh, as you, as you uh, grew your, your brand, you had to have a way for people to still engage with you, even though they weren't, it wasn't necessarily you, it was still engaging with your brand, which is fantastic. Yeah, money saver, I think here in the comments has it right. Price versus value. Amen. That's a better way of saying what I was trying to struggle through. (laughs) Money saver cuts to the chase. Uh, 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 Ron has a question for you, Dan, uh, which which I think, who's your favorite magician? I'm a classic. I love David Copperfield, but I've studied all the greats. Uh, I love how short and concise David Blaine is as well. Uh, Stick Critter also said, did billionaires ever give you financial advice? Uh, I did get some advice uh, from some of these clients, but one thing that I really love doing is taking pictures of every one of their libraries. I would ask for permission, of course, and I would take pictures, and I'd find some overlapping um, books that you'd see in a lot of their um, bookshelves. Ah. I performed for Tim Ferriss four times of the four-hour work week. And after I performed for him at each of his book launches, I actually went through his book. And there's some gems in there about lifestyle. Yeah. There's some things that I really took away. Was that, you know? was that second best to being on with us? 
Yeah, yeah, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> and the reason for that is I actually didn't have to drive. To get here. <laughs> I would drive to meet Tim Ferriss. I'm just yeah. saying, I probably would. I'd be all I would right. drive to meet Dan. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. When you're out in Fremont, let me know. And uh, definitely if um, Tim Ferriss throws another party, uh, I'll, I'll try to sneak you in. As my sound guy, right? Sound that, that, guy. As anything. I can be the guy you cut in half. I don't even care. <laughs> I've got a question uh, for you from James Hill. It says, Dan, how do you make financial plans and budget in a career with variable income? I, and it's, and it's, and I love this question because there's a lot of people out there who are paid by commission or they don't get a steady paycheck. Like, how do you decide how much you're going to eat every week when you're not sure w what the, w w what's coming? You don't turn down work in the beginning or you just take that $100 deposit and then I can send anybody. So I can always bid higher. For example, if there's three shows, um, three inquiries for a day and nothing's booked through, the price is going to be higher on that. Most people think, oh, I'm just going to charge a flat fee. But I actually watch and I see when those events stack up. And that's how I really stack those Benjamins. Nice job. <laughs> it's <Wait>. dynamic <laughs> pricing. Exactly. Yeah. Dynamic Earth pricing like uh, like like, like Uber airplanes. Or like that. Yeah. Or and I invest a lot in Google right now. Uh, I've also invested in Square. Uh, those had 600% uh, wins for me, Neil. And um, yeah, I, I have quite a few different companies that have hired me. And every time they hire me, I'll actually buy one token share of stock in every one and I'll track it. But that's also makes for good media because I've been pitching media on LinkedIn, Wall Street Journal. And the first thing I tell them is pre IPO PayPal. The second thing is I've invested shares of stock and which one of these companies have I invested a hundred thousand dollars in, or which one of them have grown a hundred <laughs> to a hundred thousand. And that just gets those email inboxes open. So I've been featured in business insider twice, a uh, once as a billionaire's magician and once for my pivot to zoom. We can't, we can't. So you learned all about clickbait. <laughs> clickbait. He's sending clickbait. Just saying. We, yes. It's a great marketer. That's not clickbait. Yeah. That's great marketing. We can't ask Daniel's question, how many of Michigan license plates on the shelf? It's a, it should be zero, by the way. Should be absolutely zero, Daniel. That's a bad technically question. It's a, technically, it's a Texas plate that says Michigan on it. But. Uh, out, of all the, uh, out of all those books that you saw, uh, th th did you have a favorite? There were favorites over time. I think Ray Dalio's Principles was on the, uh, a lot of people's shelves. Yeah. And that's the one that I really enjoyed. You see right there. That one's up there. Oh, geez. Got it right there. Yep. That is that is awesome. Well, I know you got to go. Not only is he with us tonight, he has he has another gig after us. That's a guy who knows how to hustle. Dan, if people want to get a hold of you, how do they find you? I'm at Dan Chan Magic on Instagram. Also, if you just search uh, Billionaire's Magician Dan Chan, you'll find me. And you'll also find the uh business insider article that was uh, written about me. Yeah. It, and it's a great article. You guys should read it. We also saw a cool one on Buzzfeed about you too, that we really liked on Buzzfeed news. Dan, thanks for taking a few minutes and doing some magic for us and for hanging out and talking about your career. We appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, you're amazing. Thanks for all all right, Dan Chan, everybody. And let's bring, let's bring doc Chi on for just a second. Um, Joe, you did your own magic there. You made me reappear. <laughs> <Ta -da! laughs> I, I got nobody. Nobody can see where my hands are, though. I'm clicking <laughs> stuff, uh, just trying to keep the ball rolling. There's a lot of technology running tonight. Wow, how how amazing was that, guys? I mean, the fact that Dan has uh, is working on a variable income, but just had enough belief in himself that you know what this this is what I want to do. Yeah, it really goes to show that everything is better with a little magic. Regardless of what you're talking about, magic makes everything better. It, it does make everything better. Bobby, uh, uh, so exactly how clairvoyant are you or how telepathic? He's, you and him had something Apparently going on. very. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I was very impressed with myself. Thank you very much. I did a great job. That, no, what? it was all him. I, I, I have never even virtually met him before, and I was just blown away i i can't especially the last one where i said joe i mean how how did he i was thinking like who are you gonna say i'm thinking like the statue of liberty i'm trying to think of stuff that's like in your town and i'm like i'm like oh this is impossible to get 
And then, you, and then you said Joe, and I'm like, oh, he's no. totally struggling. He's totally not going to get this one. He's he's going to try to get you to say something different. Yeah. And then he goes, Joe. By the way, uh, my son here went up to my office window, and he was like, you know. <laughs> That's fantastic. So he, he, was awesome. he was so awesome. Yeah. I, I just I, I wish I had an event happening <laughs> to hire him because he's you know I he's definitely someone that I am going to be in touch with personally so I just mm-hmm. think he's awesome ready, right. ready for the next event hey thanks so much for hanging out with us today you know if you'd like to get alerts when we do these in the future plus assuming that the COVID monster's gone the first part of uh next year tomorrow day after tomorrow hopefully soon Tell me this is ending at some point. Next fall, we're going to be visiting many, many, many cities, either doing live shows, meetups, in a couple of cases, all day events. That's coming next fall. But we're also going to do three more of these stack online events next year, plus other live recordings. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash stacker. And that's where you'll get our email alerts for everything like this event. Hey, do you own or rent your own home? Sure you do. Bet it can be hard work. It is for me. We're installing carpet today. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. And it's a good thing too, because you already have so much to do around your house, like getting carpet installed, like raking leaves. I've got so many leaves. Head to Geico.com. Get a quote and see how much you can save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. We have started working with Monday.com. This is funny. My son works uh, for Microsoft, and I told him that we were moving all of our systems over to Monday.com, and he goes, I love Monday.com. A lot of people he works with use Monday.com. It makes it easy for him, and we are setting up our system right now, and man, I just, I can't tell you how excited I am about it. Eddie, the guy training us on it is phenomenal. We're taking all these systems. We have five different systems and we're moving them to one with monday.com. So even though this podcast is broadcast from my mom's basement, it, it takes a team all over the place to make this happen. We have eight different people who are bringing together on monday.com. They all really make this show go and as we're bouncing stuff off each other, getting everything in one place is super duper important. Monday.com is an easy to use, flexible and visual, very, very visual online platform designed to manage any size team organization or process online. In fact, OG uses it for his financial planning practice. Started it when it was just him, use it with three people. I use it with eight. My son, Nick, the guy he works with, hundreds of people, all on monday.com. So no more lost emails, countless video calls, vague action items, endless back and forth for simple projects. Plan, manage, and track everything your team's working on in one centralized place. A cool thing is uh, the automations that happen. So in our old system, we would have these checkboxes to send. Once this is done, send an email to so-and-so. Monday.com does that automatically for us, just as an example of how it makes it easier. Connects with all the tools, by the way, that we already use. We use Slack, we use Dropbox, we use Zoom, we use Google Calendar, we use Gmail. All of those in one place with monday.com in one tab instead of five. Gertrude, by the way, always has 30 tabs open. Lots of ready-to-go templates for any use case, built-in solutions for your industry workflow. In fact, Eddie works with, with other podcasters, knows our language, has made it so much easier. So if you want your team to be more effective than ever, visit monday.com for your free two-week trial. You get a two-week trial just because you're a stacker. Monday.com for your free two-week trial. Speaking of next, you guys ready for for our next our our next guest? Definitely. This is a, yeah. just because I got a lot of clicking to do. I'm going to start clicking, say goodbye. Say goodbye. See ya. And say goodbye. Okay. Uh, I'm super excited to introduce our next guest. Uh, I found, we found as a team, Michael Santos, when we were watching a million stories video. And if you haven't watched million stories, not only does, does Michael have a phenomenal story, you're about to hear it here, but also their face plant series that he's a part of is about this idea that you can, you can change. You can have things that go badly for you. And, and and Michael said, 
had, as you're about to see, a lot of stuff go badly for him and you can change your life around. You can change things. And so uh, for tonight, we created a, a, a link just so I can say it while people are watching because I, I wasn't going to be able to put the whole thing on the screen. StackyBenjamins.com uh, 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 forward slash face plant. So go to StackyBenjamins.com forward slash face plant. But you know what? We'll have the direct link on our show notes page at StackyBenjamins.com. But enough about that. I would introduce him to you more, but I want him to tell you a lot of his story. Ladies and gentlemen, let's say hello to our next guest, Mr. Michael Santos, joining us. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Super excited to be here with your team. How do you follow a magician? Yeah, it's amazing, right? You got to make, 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 make myself appear or disappear. I don't know how to do that, but I am glad to be able to uh, talk with your team and, and, uh, and, and spend time with your audience. Well, y you made yourself disappear from society for 20-something years, right? Yeah, some bad decisions as a young man put me in the crosshairs of the criminal justice system and gave me uh, 26 years of free room and board. <laughs> right, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> let's let's start let's start at the very beginning, uh, Michael, because because I'm curious. You're a kid growing up in Seattle. You're from what seems like a great family, like a like a, a average family. Um, you were helping out with the business and didn't really love helping out with the family business. <laughs> yeah, I didn't quite have the good character to uh, to stick with my father's immigrant story of, of of coming to America and working hard and building a great business. I got a little bit influenced by the fast life. I I saw this movie Scarface and and, and didn't quite get the meaning um, that, that at the end of this movie you're either going to end up dead or in prison. And as a result, I just started moving down this path that put me in, in into some very uh, difficult, complicated situations. I want, I want I'm going to stop on Scarface for just a second because I saw Scarface, and for people that haven't seen Scarface, there's a scene there partway through the movie, Michael. Where, well, you know the scene very much, where a guy uh, they they they, they, they uh, handcuff him to a shower, and they take out a uh, chainsaw. And bad stuff happens. Like for yeah. me, for, if I watch Scar, that's all. That, that's the main scene I remember from Scarface. But that that scene didn't face you at all. So I remembered uh, a better scene was when he was picking up the Porsche 928, and I said, "Now oh, that's what I want to do." <laughs> <laughs> but we we tend to see what we like to see, uh, particularly with it with, when we have all the wisdom of a 20 year old, which is what I had back in 1985 when I saw that movie and. Uh, like I said, it just led me down this rather long, lengthy path of about 18 months of moving to South Florida, um, wrongfully believing that if I didn't get caught with cocaine, I, I wouldn't really be breaking the law. So I put other people in, in, in between me and the drugs, and uh, it didn't work out so well for me. Did, in the end. did you start, though, did you start with drugs in Seattle, or did you fly to Miami to get involved? Um. Well, I saw the movie. My father's from Cuba. So as, as, as they showed on Faceplant, I had a friend that his father had escaped with my father. And I just figured since he'd grown up in Miami, he must know somebody. So I just called him on the phone and did market research that way and just asked, uh, you know, what is the price of cocaine in South Florida? And I learned it. And then I found people that were kind of in this fast life that I was running in when I was 20 and try to find out what is the price in Seattle. And that little bit of market research uh, convinced me to make the trip to South Florida. And, uh, and, and, and within a 24 hours, I was a drug dealer. So you, you were plugged in. I was plugged in. Yeah. I called the guy. I said, you must know somebody. He says, of course I live in Miami. And he introduced me to people and days later I was trafficking and it lasted for about 18 months. That's what I was going to ask. How good was the money? Um, well, for a 20 year old, you know, it seemed, it seemed like a lot, but when you amortize it out and you say, well, you're going to do 26 years in prison. It's really not great. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed better then than it does now is what you're saying. I think. Yeah. I mean, I was really blinded. This was before we really launched the war on drugs. Like I said, this was in 1985. Ronald Reagan was in the white house. Um, in my you know, limited vision of the, during the recklessness of youth, cocaine kind of had this glamorous feel to it for me. And I believe that if I wasn't touching it or, 
or are storing it, I, I wasn't really breaking the law. And so I would just have my friends pick it up and deliver it. And of course, that exposed me to much more serious complications with the law. Yeah, that's interesting, because you always thought being insulated that one step would would insulate you. I mean, it, 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 and it's funny saying that now, like, I, I've, whenever I see you say that line, you kind of have like this eye roll, like, yeah, I thought, I thought then. Well, I was, I was really, I was really, there's no, nobody that's responsible but me. I mean, I made my decisions. I, I never say that I made a mistake because I, I knew what I was doing. I was sure. trying to engage in, in this uh, quick money scheme and it was a bad idea and it cost, uh, you know, I, I, I regret what I did. Um, but, you know, it sent me through prison where I had an opportunity to reinvent myself, to recalibrate and work towards striving to make amends. B Moral has a has a comment that I thought was was kind of funny. He says, "Does being a Miami drug dealer come with a good four hundred one k match?" <laughs> probably, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. Um, uh, did you ever feel like you, you know you, Scarface, right? Violence, all this stuff. Did you ever feel like you personally were in danger? No, no, I, I I'm only, you know, I, well, there were all kids like my age, you know, 20 years old that were, you know, from suburban backgrounds that, uh, you know, this was before ga- the proliferation of gangs. And I mean, there was certainly a lot of violence, but we, there was no guns in our case. It was just all suburban kids involved in something wrong. And when people got caught, they, you know, they, they pleaded guilty. They did the right thing, pleaded guilty, and they cooperated against me. And I uh, was the one that didn't cooperate. And so I got 45, a 45 year sentence. Yeah. And I want to ask that because man, my blood kind of boiled when I saw that. I mean, it, it sounded a lot like, like bad financial advisors, bad lawyers, like you had what seemed like the worst, but before we get there at some point you felt threatened because you, because you fled. Tell me about the decision to flee the country. Could you feel that you might get arrested at that point? Why did you leave? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing. I, I grew up in an immigrant family and, you know, always working hard and wanting to be something that I guess I wasn't. And um, so that, you know, I think insecurity is what led me into that path as they showed so well on the, the face plant episode that a million stories published. And so I just decided to run down this path. And as a result of running down that path, I got involved at a, at a, at a high level really quickly. Um, when, by the time I was in it for about 15 months, I really recognized that I'd made some bad decisions. Um, I was, I, I just, I didn't like being a criminal. It was, I didn't even like acknowledging that I was a criminal. Um, and, and so uh, people around me started to get in trouble. And so I just r- wanted to start my life someplace else. And I, I went to Spain thinking that that would be a place to, to, to reinvent my life. Well, that's what I was thinking. Even when I was, even when I was hearing your story, I was watching the video and I, and I, and I the, for the first time getting in introduced to you and I saw Spain. I'm like, that sounds great. (laughs) Yeah, it was, I mean, everything was an illusion for me at that time in my life. And I just didn't fully appreciate the magnitude of harm that I was causing, not only to the people that were abusing drugs, but also to my family and the people who cared about me. And then when I got caught, I went and made a series of more uh, bad decisions. I, I didn't accept responsibility. I didn't plead guilty, even though I knew I was guilty. I went to trial and just really dug myself into a very deep hole. Tell me about just briefly when you, you got back to Miami and I'm just imagining the knock on the door. I was in Spain. I called my attorney because I had an attorney on retainer. I just said, is everything okay? He said, yeah, it's fine. I came back to the United States and I may have been in the United States for two weeks or so. And the DEA came to, I, I lived on Key Biscayne and they came to the place that I was living and, you know, I could see their their uh, windbreakers with the DEA uh, em- emblazoned on their back, and they, they just told me put my hands up, and that was it. That was August the 11th, 1987. I had no idea the complexity of crime that I was involved in, but I was facing a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. I didn't know what that meant. I'd never been arrested before, but I was taken into custody that day. Uh, on Key Biscayne on August 11th, 1987, and I was incarcerated for 9,500 days. Man, and and I'm I'm just imagining what's going on in your head at that time. But your 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 lawyer tells you to fight it. 
Yeah, well, my lawyer, you know, I mean, there are a lot of great lawyers, uh, but but when you have a, a, a kid like me that was somewhat arrogant and, and really wa- uh, wanted to believe that I wasn't going to go to prison, you'll have some lawyers that will tell you what you want to hear rather than what you need to hear. What I needed to hear was you've made some bad decisions. It's time to recalibrate and make amends and accept responsibility and you're going to go to prison, but you can resume your life. I didn't hear that message. And as a result, I made every bad decision a guy could make. And I was uh, convicted at trial. I, I perjured myself on the stand, exposing myself to a longer sentence. And at the end of the day, my judge sentenced me to 45 years. But at the time that I was sentenced, there was um, a different sentencing scheme in place, and it resulted in me serving 26 years. Yeah, I, so everybody has uh, a, a, a low point where, where they know that things just have to change. When did, when did you have your low point, and walk me through that? I, I was inside the Pierce County Jail in Tacoma, Washington. Um, it wasn't until I was convicted, till a jury returned a verdict of guilty on all counts, and I just went back and, and I was in a solitary cell and I remember lying on my rack and just putting my hands behind my uh, head and staring at the ceiling and not believing that this is going to be my life. But I had to accept it at that moment. And at that moment, I start to pray. And it was those prayers that led me to a philosophy book. And like I said before, I've, I didn't know how to spell philosophy. I think I said that on the face plan <laughs> episode, but I'm, I'm reading this story of Socrates who was, facing a death sentence and waiting for his execution. And his response to that really changed my mindset and helped me realize that uh, what I need to do today is stop thinking about the bad decisions that I make or what's happening to me and start thinking about people like you and the audience of of Stacking Benjamins and saying, what, if anything, can I do to to make amends and, and start working my way back or climbing my way back to a life of liberty and, and uh, contribution and meaning. This is, this is the amazing part of the story, and I absolutely love this. What's the first thing then that you did on your path to redemption, really redemption of yourself, or for yourself? So great question. I remember reading this story of the Crito of Socrates inside of a jail cell and feeling so inspired. I hadn't been sentenced yet, but I felt so inspired after reading that story that I, I got up and I, and I took this little pencil, right? I mean, this bit of technology, a little smaller than this because this would have been a weapon in the jail. So I take this pen and I started writing letters and I wrote a letter to the newspaper that had been covering my trial. And I told them I'd made a lot of bad decisions and, and I was going to change my life. And every day that I serve in prison, I'm going to work toward making amends. And I, and I articulated this plan that I kind of learned from Socrates that by thinking instead of what I want, what, what's happening to me, I start thinking about what, if anything, could I do to earn uh, liberty or to earn freedom? And it came across with this three-pronged plan that guided me through every day going forward after that. Is there a beginning approach to Socrates or a book that you can tell our audience is a, is a great place to start to grab hold of this for themselves? Yeah, well, Socrates is, is really a lot about the translation and because it's you know written in 2,500-year-old Greek. Um, the Penguin translation is what I read. I, I still have a copy of it here because it had such a, a monumental impact on my life. Um, so the Penguin translation of the Republic is phenomenal. It really helps a person learn how to think. And for your audience, who's really always learning how to reinvent itself and, and, and build a stronger uh, financial background, I think that always begins by asking good questions. And so if we read Plato's Republic and you get into this story of the dialogues, we really learn how every decision we make opens opportunities or presents threats. Like uh, Mr. Chan had said in the previous episode, the SWOT analysis, you know, what are our strengths? What yeah. are our weaknesses, our opportunities and our threats? And, 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 and really we, we, we'd like to think of that as being a modern uh, uh, recipe for success in, in this era. But the reality is that's the same thing that Socrates t- taught is really identify what, how you define value in your life and, and, and what can you do to get there? And, and that's what I learned from, from that book. So it's the most powerful book for me was The Republic by Plato. Life-changing. You, you started off, and let's bring in uh, OG and Bobby Rebell again, because uh, uh, they'll have some questions too for you, Michael. But I wanted to ask about, uh, about your degrees, because you set out, my understanding is you set out, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but you set out to get a bachelor's degree. You end up with a PhD. Tell me, tell me about that. 
Yeah, so I, I want to clarify that. I, got, I, I was in prison. I read this story of Socrates. It made me come up with this three-pronged plan that said every day that I serve in prison, I'm going to try and reconcile. And I, and I thought, what do I need to do to reconcile? And that was three things. One was, you know, people in society would want me to educate myself. That would be one way that I could show I don't want to be a criminal anymore. So I focused on education. The second was finding ways to contribute to society in meaningful, measurable ways. And three was to build a strong support network. That was like my three-part plan to make it through. And, and so I started writing letters because I didn't have any money. So I started writing letters to universities and just saying I made really bad decisions. I'm in prison. I'm serving a 45-year sentence, but I want to be a law-abiding citizen someday. And can I go to school? And, you know, you send one letter, no response. Ten letters, ten times better chance of not getting a response. But if you send 100 letters, you get, you get a response. And I was really blessed to get an opportunity to study. And I earned my undergraduate degree in 1992. Then I wanted to go to law school. I started writing to law schools. Uh, they told me that, you know, you can't do that while you're in prison, maybe when you come home. But one of the schools, Hofstra in New York, uh, was very supportive. And they said, We're, we admire what you've done because I'd already got my undergrad. And they said, you know, you can, on a probationary period, we have more flexibility with a master's program. And they asked what I'd like to study. I said, I really think mass incarceration is one of the greatest social injustices of our time. And I want to learn about it. And, and see if I can have some influence on, on improving our nation's criminal justice system. And they had allowed me to, to begin a program. So I got my master's at Hofstra. While I was doing that, I was publishing a lot. And one of my publishers was the dean at uh, University of Connecticut, at Storrs, Connecticut. And I got into the PhD program there and I did my first year, but then the warden blocked me. So I didn't finish the PhD. I only did the first year toward a PhD. Uh, the warden blocked me saying that taxpayers didn't want people in prison getting uh, PhDs. Really? So, really? Good news. There's a, always good news. There's a flip side to that. That's what put me into the market. And, <laughs> and so I started investing from prison and uh, changed my life. <laughs> how did you, well, first of all, how did, there's some money. How did you start investing in prison? How do you have money? So great question. Like I said, I was writing a lot right. and I became an author. So, you know, earning minimal amounts of money from prison, I would, um, this was the dawn of the internet around the same time Mr. Chan was at PayPal. Uh, and this is like the mid 1990s, um, really believed that the internet was going to change the world and wanted to have a role in it. And so one of the ways that I could do that was by investing because I had never, you know, I couldn't access the internet. I, I could read about it and I'd been reading a lot and studying a lot. And I really believed it was going to have a huge influence. So I started investing. And at the time, the, the PayPal's and the Google's of the day were actually Yahoo, America Online and Amazon. And uh, this was, like I said, the 1998. I started investing and using margin and leveraging my way and <laughs> traded uh, millions of dollars from a $2,000 investment using margin and reached a peak on August the, no, April the 12th, 1999, made more than a million dollars in prison. When oh I still my. had 13 years to go. <laughs> so completely changed my life. The good news is uh, it taught me a lot, but it also taught me that, that investing was not going to be my pathway to success. But it did give me a, a great, some great learning lessons, and I can walk you through those if you're Why, interested. Uh, well, wait a minute. Why is that not going to be your pathway to success? Clearly, you're good at it. Well, no, there's a difference between being good and being lucky. Uh, <laughs> and I'll take luck every time. <laughs> so I, was, uh, I invested in, in, like I said, I kept leveraging my way, Yahoo, uh, Yahoo and America Online primarily, but then really started getting involved in high beta stocks like at-home communications, CNET technologies, I remember, DoubleClick, which eventually became Google, um, but leveraging my way up. And then because I was in such highly volatile stocks and heavily leveraged, um, I had a million dollars in equity at, on, in April, but also a million dollars in margin debt. So $2 million portfolio. And it was really skyrocketing. There's a hyperbolic move. But the, uh, when the market crashed, it, uh, uh, the first you know, internet 1.0 before 2.0, um, 
what goes up goes down like a brick. And <laughs> those highly leveraged stocks quickly imploded. But still, it, made, it was big enough to change my life because I started with nothing. And sure. after I paid my tax from prison, I still had more than 100 grand in the bank. And, and that really changed my life. It allowed me to get married and build a new career, which has been incredibly fulfilling. Uh, 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 Bobby, uh, you have some questions about that. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. And I have you. <laughs> you did that again. And again. All right. So first of all, thank Hi, you so much. I thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I, I was so impressed with everything that you've done. So thank you for the tips. I hope everyone sort of gets motivated. We talked about showing up. The timeout is over at the top of this show. The timeout. I mean, if, if, we need anything to inspire us to get going. Um, you've definitely delivered tonight. So I, I thank no you so much for that. It's quarantine here. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really well, great businesses. Like Phenomenal what? Businesses that are tell just us. Well, right tell now. us. Tell us. So um, I have a website at prisonprofessors.com. And one of the things that I do is I create digital content that I sell to jails and prisons across America. So more than 100,000 people go through my courses in, in jail and prison, where I'm just basically teaching one of the courses I call the CEO mindset, which is really identifying success, uh, documenting a strategy, creating tools, tactics, and resources, and then executing the plan every day. And I document it by creating these videos that I publish on our YouTube channel, but then I put them on flash drives or drives or on a cloud-based system and send them into jails and prisons where people in jail and prisons, you know, they're overly represented by people of color and people that don't have opportunities. My message to them is, there's not gonna be a lot of job opportunities for when you come out. I'm gonna teach you how to think differently and start preparing yourself an entrepreneurial mindset. And so that's been a really phenomenal uh, uh, business for me where I'm in you know, every state prison in California, uh, several federal Bureau of Prisons facilities, but that led me to do something else because I started interacting with so many formerly incarcerated people that didn't have jobs and if you look on my website now, I, I've built this whole new contributors page where I'm building a business for government investigations that helps small and medium sized business owners understand that have nothing to do with law enforcement, but help them understand how decisions in the course of business, sadly, leads many people into uh, very costly government investigations and sometimes white collar crimes. So our team can go in there and help people. And it's a very lucrative market. It, it's a great niche. And I, I'm really bullish on it. The, uh, the thing that, and I don't know where, I, I don't know if it was in the million stories video, Michael, or if it was elsewhere, but part of the reason you're really passionate about this is when you were getting out, somebody said something to you about how, how lucky you were, how different you were. I don't remember exactly what happened, but I remember thinking, I, I can't believe somebody would say that to you. Tell, tell that story. If you know what the hell I'm talking about. Well, I mean, I, I know I know a lot of people. I've met a lot of people in society that are in you know a, a, a prison that's I think bigger than one that I was ever in, and they didn't break any laws, but 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 they didn't they, they, the way that they think keeps a lot of people boxed in, and they, and and they can't be you know something like a, a national pandemic or a global pandemic happens in their life just spins out of control. But the reality is, all of us have the power within to find a way through and it's just discipline and, and, and it, it's really starts, as I said, by defining success and, and learning these strategies that leaders like Socrates or Mandela or Viktor Frankl or, 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 or Warren Buffett or Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. Steve Jobs had a great quote. He said, um, you know, a good artist copies ideas, but a great artist steals ideas. And since I was in prison, I just stole ideas from all these great leaders and they really helped me transform my life. And, you know, I do, I do feel lucky and I do feel fortunate uh, in so many ways because, you know, I, I've been able to weather the storms of human life and, and, and life is, is like a journey, you know, and I've learned that from, from, from leaders, both fictional and uh, non-fictional. And they helped me grow. So I'm, I'm lucky. We're all lucky. <laughs> We're about to take questions from uh, you guys uh, hanging out with us. So bring your questions. I know we have a few. I'm going to flip back through those here in a second. But OG. I'll tell you what, Rose, thank you for your story, Michael. I appreciate that. And, uh, and if, if, if you needed some motivation to, to, uh, you know, put one foot in front of the other tomorrow for whatever reason, you know, and you can't get it out of your story. I don't, I don't, you, you 
something must be wrong. Um, the thing that really struck me, you were talking about how you finally figured out that you made some bad decisions. And at that point in time, you just kind of came to acceptance with that and said, okay, that stuff's in the past. It is what it is. Here I am. And now I have to make different decisions. And, and it really struck me because from a money perspective, sometimes we get so tied up in like, Oh, I can't get out of this. Or I may, you know, and thinking about like debt or, 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 or a bad relationship that ruins some stuff. Or, you know, I went to school and I've got hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loans. And I, you know, I don't see a way out of this. And, and, you know, we see this on the show a lot. I think that the biggest message and I, what I heard you say was it's okay. It, it, this stuff's in the past. And now, now you just have to make different decisions moving forward and, and, and be okay with the new decisions. And it, it didn't take you, it didn't take you a long time to, or it did take you a long time to get into this trouble. It's going to take you a lot of time to get out of it too. But we all can. And that's the, that's the empower, that's the empowering message that I think is, is that we're all resilient. We all have, you know, challenges in life and, and we all can, can create lives of meaning and relevance and dignity. If we can really, adhere to those that principled path of of identifying what is success for us and 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 i, I hear from bill flagard what what has life been like after leaving prison well bill thanks all, first of all for answering the question but but every day is a dream of course i mean i i live here in a beautiful community in orange county and I, i'm married i got married in prison i've been married now for 18 years and um I have just opportunities that um, I, every day I feel blessed and every, every day I feel fortunate and, and I have the great fulfilling job of being able to work with people who are in challenging situations and, and show them a pathway to, to make it through. And that's what I do every day. So you, it's, it's exciting. You've spoken a lot about uh, prison reform, uh, uh, books about prison reform. Uh, uh, Mike has, has done some classes. Um, uh, I believe he said on, uh, at a community course for four semesters at the youth prison in California. Uh, he asks, how close is the correlation with education reduction and reduction of recidiv recidivism? <laughs> yes, easy for you to say. It, it totally is in our prisons. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very clear that education is, is really, in my opinion, as close as we're going to get to an elixir to the prison system is, is, is helping people that have been marginalized and, and, and frequently struggle through intergenerational cycles of recidivism. So they really come into the world without a, a lot of opportunity or chance. Or situationally, they go into the prison system. And the irony in prison, we call it a system of corrections. But the longer we expose somebody to corrections, the less likely that person is to function in society. So, so education is really the only pathway that can change it. We've got to learn how to think differently. We've got to learn, uh, if we're in prison, we've got to learn how to be very uh, intentional with regard to the people we associate with. And we, we've got to learn how to really be, live a values-based, goal-oriented life. And, and, and truthfully, anybody who's been in prison, in my mind, has a duty and a responsibility if you become successful on the other side to go back in. So I, I go in a lot. Um, of course, during the, the pandemic, the, the way that I do it is virtually. But I have been in prisons. And the funny thing, when I go into prisons now, you know, I'll go in suited up and they'll, they'll look at me like I'm, you know, a lawyer or a probation officer or something. And someone says, ah, that fool was never in prison. And I said, you think you're giving me an insult because I don't look hard enough. But there's a little <laughs> secret in that. You know, that was the plan you know, to come back and be able to function out here. And, that, and that's what I try to teach other people how to do. That is fantastic. I'm so happy you were able to hang out with us and share some of your story. Uh, where can people reach you, Michael? I, I think the easiest way is through prisonprofessors.com or our YouTube channel yeah. at Prison Professors. But I am really super easy to find on Google. If you just know my name, Michael Santos, I do want to recommend again that people visit the, the amazing story that the Singleton Foundation produced at millionstories.com on Faceplant because they just offer so much great education for, for, for people in your audience that are striving to, uh, to, to build economic security. And in this era of a pandemic, it's super important to, to focus on, on, on opportunities to grow. Yeah, I agree. Your story, Glozell's story, there's so many cool stories there and they do such a great job for people that don't know about the million stories. People, these people are all Hollywood professionals. And so th they take these videos and I've been telling everybody, Michael, like the best nine minutes you can spend is, is watching Michael Santos' story. It is a great, great nine minutes. So uh, we'll have a link by the way, 
again to million stories also and to and to find michael on our show notes at stackybenjamins.com man it was so great to meet you thank you so much for sharing some time with us i really appreciate it Super grateful to, to, to Bobby, OG, Doc G, <laughs> and, and, and you, Joe, and, and, and the entire team at Stack and Benjamins. I uh, hope that you guys all uh, find success and, and have a fabulous holiday season. Thank you, man. You too. Thank you. you too. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's bring uh, Doc G back in here. Uh, wow. How is that? And I thought we couldn't beat magic. And talk about hope. Let's think about this. Like we have all gone through something in life, right? We've all hit our own version of rock bottom. This guy was looking at 45 years in prison. And what did he do? He read something that inspired him. And then he took one step at a time. And I don't know if there's any better explanation of what you do when things are really bad. Uh, but this guy created a life for himself in a place where I think most of us would have probably given up. Yeah. Uh, so it, it really is. It's a very hopeful story that wherever you are in life right now, uh, it's a good story and taking one step at a time. And if you can do that, you can end up in a better place. Well, and I, and most people do give up, you know, I mean, you just don't hear Bobby, you don't hear his story coming out of prison. No, and look, we, we didn't get into the fact that he got married too much. He alluded, he talked about it a little bit, but we didn't talk about the fact that this is somebody that he reconnected with that he knew earlier in his life. He's been married 18 years. I'm not sure how many years has he been out of prison. So, I mean, how many years of that was he in prison? I mean, the fact that he his his vision was so compelling that you know, he was able to fall in love with, you know, his, to have this marriage be successful. And it just seems so wonderful um, to have that whole life. And he really thought forward. It almost re reminds me of, you know, those, you know, when they tell you to think about your future self, you know, there's no apps that'll make you look old, um, <laughs> even before you're old. But, you know, it almost feels like he looked at his future self while he was in prison and said, what do I want? this future me to look like and for my life to look like and I want to have you know a family and I want to have you know financial security and I want to have a mission a purpose which is all the things that he's doing I mean he talks about them as businesses which they are but they're very much businesses with a purpose I and, mean he's definitely yes. out there you know helping the world it's yeah. not just about the money and he's very flip about the fact that he you know lost that the paper money from the stock market um, what he seems to clearly care about a lot more is the businesses that help people. Absolutely. And OG, it comes back, I think, to your point when Michael was here that, what's that phrase? The past does not equal the future. And no yeah. matter what we're facing, you can change tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just, you know, tomorrow is however you want it to be, right? I mean, it's just, it's it's not here yet. So you get to uh, decide what you uh, what you want it to look like. Such, a, such an amazing story. Um, I'm not easily impressed, but that's impressive. All right, guys, we're rolling into our biggest guest of the night, the one that I'm sure if, if you haven't heard Michael Santos's story before, by the way, make sure you head to millionstories.com. Just so amazing. Dan Chan, also amazing. By the way, if you want to hear something amazing and you pay your credit cards off in full every month, Discover matches all the cash back you earn on your credit card at the end of your first year automatically with no limit on how much you can earn. How amazing is that? In fact, it's even more amazing because of all the places where Discover is accepted. 99% of places in the U.S. that take credit cards. So when it comes to Discover, get used to hearing yes more often. Learn more at discover.com slash yes. 2020 Nielsen Report. Limitations apply. Doc, pretty, Doc pretty G awesome. was talking earlier about in, inspiring books, right? I, I, I wish we knew somebody that had a book that was a little inspiring. <laughs> if, if, if only there was somebody we could talk to who might have an inspiring book. Boy, that, yeah, that, would, might be. that, that would just bring the house down, wouldn't it? I mean, we'd have the <laughs> crowd cheering and the whole thing. Yeah, so I'm going to say goodbye to you guys so we can introduce somebody who might have uh, one of those books. Goodbye, Bobby. Goodbye, Doc G. Goodbye, OG. We got all the Gs. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, I am so happy that we get to spend time with her again. The first time when her book uh, went through a reprint, we were very lucky to be part of the book tour. I, I remember telling everybody, I get to talk to Vicki Robin. And I'm so excited that tonight we're going to get to talk to Vicki Robin again. And I have to tell you, 
there's a lot of people, you know, we get a lot of questions at Stacky Benjamins about money, money, and how do I get more? How do I get more? How do I get more? And it's funny, I think a lot of people don't think about the philosophy behind why and how. And if you've never seen Vicki Robin when she was on Oprah, just the aha that even Oprah Winfrey had uh, to Vicki's philosophy on money and on life, uh, it is a very powerful thing. So here with us tonight, I'd like to welcome the star of tonight's show, a woman I'm very happy to call my friend, Vicki Robin, joining me. Hi. <laughs> so how, how are you? It's great to have you. Yeah, no, it's uh, all is good. All is good. How are you doing? Uh, fantastic. I, I, I have to start off. When I saw that Vicki Robin has a podcast, like I'm sure you're in podcasting for all the big money that we're all making, right? <laughs> I don't make anything. I have to raise money to pay the people who help me out. But is, isn't it fun? It is. And it's getting more deeply fun. You know, I'm considering I've done sort of like two sets, like two seasons, if, if you will. And now I'm looking ahead and they were, they're called what could possibly go right. And I started doing it when the pandemic hit, because of course, you know, <laughs> this year has been, what else could possibly go wrong? And so I wanted to like, oh, and there's Jennifer. Hi, Jen. Hey, um, Jen. There's Jen. <laughs> there's Jen. Yeah. So I, I, but I feel like in every, every breakdown, there's a, there's an opportunity um, and it's not, you know, because of how I live, it's not opportunities for personal profit necessarily, but there's an opportunity for a, a reset on society. Some of the rules of the game that are, that are being toxic to nature or people. So I was very curious. So I got a lot of really interesting, what I call cultural scouts on people who have, you know, who are far seeing long in tooth um, and um, activists like what what are you seeing on the horizon the the, the dust that's flying yeah like in, in, looking, sort of looking, yeah, into, the looking into the fog yeah. yeah exactly and such interesting answers and answers that have helped me you know very much helped me um, I want to go back totally. to I want to go back to because for people that are new to to your money or your life, you know what a huge book this was for so many people, Vicky. We talked about it last time that we were together, but but, but take me back to the to the making of that. T tell me about what the goal was when you first set out to to make this book. Oh, okay. Well, well, there's like several stages. Um, early on, Joe's purpose when he you know he designed this. It wasn't a nine-step program. It was just him doing what he thought was obvious in order to retire by the time he was 30, not with, um, um, you know, not with a million dollars, but with enough money invested in a stable way so that he could free up his time to have a, to have a life. And he didn't even know what it was, but he just thought, like, this game of selling your time for money, 95 to 65, you make what he called making a dying. This makes no sense whatsoever. So, so he decided, okay, I'm going to do it differently. I call, I used to call him the, a genius of the obvious. You know, you know, you can have the obvious right in front of you, but if your belief system says that thing isn't there, you won't see it. But for Joe, he just he didn't have that sort of cloud of false beliefs. And he just looked at it and he said, this game doesn't work. The only people the game works for are the people who are, who do not identify themselves as uh, according to money and stuff. They know that their lives are bigger than money. And those are the people he saw were successful. So he tried to create that for himself. And I met him. Um, was he the, was he was he Vicky was he teaching that or to, to other people or was he did, was that in his no, head he and he believed it anything to anybody yeah. you know like just sort of like get off my ankles <laughs> <laughs> you know, no he, he I mean if anything over the years so I met him fairly soon after his her own early retirement we were at an event together and what he told me was like made perfect sense to me and I had saved some money. And I was also like him. I was sort of a, a smart person on a quest for truth. And back in 1969, you could do that without, you know, it was sort of a boomer privilege that we could we could actually step outside of that sort of lockstep chain. I mean, I know people now are can't really step off that right. conveyor belt very easily and survive, but we could. And so we really wanted to think about life. And um, so that was like 
you know, that's what drew me to him. And he explained his methodology. And I took the money that I had saved that I was going to like spend through and then, you know, go back to work. And I, and I invested it and I, I lived on almost nothing. So anyway, money is such a great way to ask the question, what matters most? What's, re what's really real to me? Um, I have a limited amount of time in my life, and this is part of what we teach in Your Money, Your Life, is basically, you know, especially with credit cards, money seems infinite. You know, like there's always more where that came from somehow. You know, I can always make more. But your life is limited. And let's take a look at how many real hours you have and what you want to do in that life. And, and it's, it's just one of the tools in Your Money, Your Life that helps people step back from trying to play the obvious game better, you know, trying to play the money game better because the money game dominates everything in our society. You know, it's sort of what the game we're given to play. So if you step back from that and you say, okay, I want to be a good partner. I want to uh, be a, a good son or daughter, aunt or uncle, mother, father. I, I'll have all that stuff that I want to do with my time. I really would like to learn another language. I'd like to travel. You know, it's like you start listing off the things that you would love to have in your life. And most of them, if you say you want money, I don't believe you want money. You just think that money mediates the opportunity to have the things that you really want. And so you start to take a look at what you really want and how much of your life energy do you really want to invest in the money game for how long? And that's actually what produced the whole program of, you know, that's become like sort of the fire Bible, you yeah, know, which yeah. is you make as much as you can um, without compromising your integrity and your health. You spend as little as you can, you pay off your debt, you develop savings, and you invest that in, in instruments that, were, that are fairly reliable. They will reliably throw off an income so you can liberate your time for being a good partner, aunt, uncle, mother, father, you know, sister, brother, you know, so that you can, you know, traveler, you know, artist, you know, write the great American novel or maybe two or three or five great American novels. Don't sell many, but still it doesn't matter because you have an income. <laughs> well, initially, initially, before you started teaching this, was the goal just to see how, how little you could live on? And then pick the things that were important and spend more on those yourself? Or were you play testing? Like initially, initially, what was the goal? You know, the, the goal really was to step out of a life defined by money and to see what else was there. So I mean, there's very, there's a lot of funny stories back in there, you know, so, so I lived, um, and I was part of a group and Joe was part of the group as well. And, and we lived in Northern Wisconsin on a homestead. I mean, we built a homestead out of a sort of a boggy <laughs> cranberry bog in Northern Wisconsin, but we had access to it. And a lot of it for me was about resourcefulness. I wanted to like, I did a lot of, I studied botany, I studied um, animal husbandry, I studied canning and I studied everything. I, I rebuilt the engine in my car twice, you know, and probably I didn't do it right the first time. But anyway, you know, I learned internal combustion engine. I learned everything I possibly could about reality. You know, reality, you know, <laughs> like, you know, in our society, you have money and money allows you to avoid a lot of reality. All you have to do is deal with the reality of money and then you can go to the store and buy your food, and, you know, pay your rent. I mean, there's a lot of things you don't have to know. So I was really interested in um, in taking money out of the equation as an adventure. Now, I know in a way I was privileged to be able to live on very little. I lived on about a hundred dollars a month for wow, um, holy cow, uh, six years of my life, and you know, grew a half acre garden, and we hunted and butchered and canned, and you know, I and so I have all that. You know that. You know, I've graduated from <laughs> from Brown University, but my real education was traipsing around in the woods. You know. We raised a pig, we raised chickens. I mean, I have four chickens in my backyard now. So basically part of it was disintermediating money, you know, 
can I throw my creativity, my hard work? Because now I'm 75, so it's a little harder with arthritis, you know, to do all the things I did back then. But I did build a chicken run, so I. <laughs> but you got the cat doing all the work now, right? Isn't the yeah, cat doing all the work? She's she does everything. So basically, that was part of the quest at that time was to master domains of life that you are not taught in school they are not social roles nobody has authorized them but they're essential pieces of being alive and i loved doing that i learned so much like i learned i learned auto mechanics because <laughs> that's something i really thought i was going to do in my life when did you decide um, to start teaching this though how did you pivot from you know what right, this is working okay, for me so to let's here's the deal there's two things there's like phase one was the sort of being asked after a while, you know, people would say, well, well, how do you make money? And we say, well, well, you know, we just, we live on a passive income, you know, not very much. <laughs> and so that we can free our time to, um, to learn about life. And uh, so eventually people were just like pulling this out of Joe, like, how did you do it? And, and when he described what he did, he actually distinguished something that's now called the nine step program. But it's, it's, a pro, it's an approach to money that allows you to see through. It basically liberates your mind. The first level is liberating your mind from identification with who you are as your, as your financial life. You know, how you make money, how much you have, the stuff you have, you know, the improving and upgrading stuff you have. So part of it is unhooking your mind and part of it is this very practical process. Um, so first we were teaching it to people just so that they could liberate their time, you know, like many bloggers are doing now. We didn't, we didn't really make, we, we gave away all the money. We gave away all the money, you know, until like, like you know, 20 years into this, uh, we didn't keep any money. But then by then Joe had passed and um, I had cancer and I sort of looked around and said, like, how am I going to pay for my cancer? Like, oh, <laughs> There's some money coming in from this book. I can do that. I got to do um, a book tour, right? <laughs> yeah, really. So, um, but the second thing was is that it, it, the, after about a, you know eight years of teaching this, and we studied people, and you know we called them after like six months, and we found out that people who actually stuck with this approach to money after six months, they were spending about twenty percent less, and they were happier. And that was like a statistic that we were carrying along wow. with us. And then I, I got religion on sustainability, which is basically meeting our needs today in a way that, that, that does not diminish the capacity of future generations to meet their needs. You know, this was like a big idea in the, in the 1980s. And I realized, because I went to a major conference, that consumerism, the, you know, the, the religion of money and stuff, is the driver, the biggest driver of the destruction of the planet. And I've learned a tremendous amount about that ever since I've studied, you know, some alternative economics, et cetera. But I thought, you know, well, wait a second, wait, wait, wait. Because I know that this program, if, if I could get everybody on the planet to do it, or at least everybody in Western society, uh, we would reduce consumption by 20%. And then we could live within the bounds of the earth and be ha happily ever after. So... I jumped on that, and that's when um, we got a contract. Actually, we were approached by somebody. We didn't even seek it out, but we got a contract to write a book, and that's what we did. And we wrote the book with the intention of it being bestseller because... Of course, because <laughs> why else are you going to write a book? Why else? No, no, no. I mean, but what our intention was we want everybody to read this book and apply it because we're going to save the planet. I'll tell you, I was a missionary for that, and I still am, am in my soul. It's just that I realized that the, the big, wide, bad world out there is a lot more resistant to my good ideas than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's only a matter of time, though, Vicki. It it's is only a matter only of time. A matter of time. I'm going to bring on the G's. We got OG coming. We got Doc G coming. And because uh, I'm sure they have some questions for you as well. But 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 I want to ask you one other thing. You you because of because of um, how passionate you are about this. This is why you believe, you know, I mean, you're talking about saving the planet. But at the same time, this makes you think very locally about investing. I know. Yeah, so basically in my investing, 
um, originally what Joe what Joe had discovered was he invested in U.S. Treasury bonds, and that so my first like bunch of money I put into U.S. Treasury bonds at nine percent interest. Of course, everybody goes like, oh, troll. <laughs> Yeah, but you know that strategy, uh, you know, is not working anymore. And I didn't want to put money into the market. I just, you know, I'm just sort of I'm a nervous Nelly, and I also am very aware that um, it's a, such a strange thing because basically your money, your life, and the whole fire movement basically instructs people that capitalism is the name of the game. You know, the people who are winners are owners of capital. The people who are losers are wage you know, wage earners. So what you want to do is transfer from being a wage earner by saving money and investing it. And you can be an owner of capital. And then, but the clever thing that we know in our movement is how much is enough. So we define how much is enough and then we can liberate our time. So we're sort of um, parsimonious capitalists, if you will. We're sort of smart capitalists. So it's like when I, when you start to think about, about, investing not just as where how can i maximize my return but what is the return i want to maximize yeah what do i want to have more of in this world because i have participated and where do i want to put my money so that more of that can happen we were so i've been investing in and i'm not being stupid you know i'm like uh, i'm preserving my capital and i'm just throwing off income so i'm i'm doing the basic thing I have invested in uh, rental property where I live and I charge a below below market but not like ridiculously low below market rent um, because affordable housing in a community like mine this very beautiful seaside community is getting scarce as hen's teeth and most people don't even think about well uh, duh, where does the waiter live <laughs> You know, because they don't think about how the working class cannot no longer live in the, the adorable community they live in. So I'm I'm focused on rentals. And that I'm whole focused- that whole area, Seattle, in general, where you're at, not just where you live, but just that general area. It's crazy. My son lives out there, Vicky, and the the prices yeah. to live are are just amazing. Right. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, your friend of mine, Paulette, lived in my guest room, you know, and that was sort of part of my whole little economy here. Um, And then I've invested in farmers and and, uh, I I, I bought out the mortgage for one farm. I bought I've invested in hoop houses. I've invested in all sorts of things that will increase uh, food resiliency in my area. And I'm passion i wrote another book called blessing the hands that beat us about local food um, you know this this pandemic has revealed the the fragility of our supply chains and that the more we can have a flourishing food system around us the better off we're going to be that's another investment see i'm investing in the future you know i'm investing in community i'm investing in food i'm investing in solar installations i'm I'm investing in a resilient community. Yeah, I think also- it's interesting that it's not just you, it's 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 your community. Like you you are investing in in that whole area and um and it helps you, but it helps the people around you, which in turn also helps you, right? I mean, it's this totally. it's this return that keeps giving. Like we have a question here about of uh, uh, from Philip about how do you separate the consequences of consumerism and compounding interest? In some ways, Vicky is getting compound interest from but but, but, but I think in a but I think in a whole different in a whole different way. Exactly. You see, the thing is, we're trained to think uh, uh, only my cat is trying to participate. Here we We, go. We did have a question. Somebody was asking, I think it's Michelle was asking if the cat was going to make a resource as money. Resource isn't only money. It's community. It's land. It's fertility. It's uh, skills. It's a pattern. It's like rebuilding my engine, my car, you know, back when we had gas cars that weren't computers. Uh, Doc, you've got a question. Yeah, you know, I'm interested, Vicki, you're talking about investing and you're talking about resources. And you're also talking about this idea of kind of separating money from reality, right? When we build and invest in ourselves, we build up a skill set. Even things like talking about how you rebuilt an engine there's a certain amount of fearlessness that you seem to have when you describe these things. And I compare it to myself when I was working full-time as a physician, 
I was afraid to walk away from the money to build up those other skill sets like podcasting or writing from a very practical level. How do people in our community build some of that fearlessness so that they can invest in themselves? It's so much easier. It seems to go out and make money. That's such a great question. And I think the key word in there is our community. Now, you know, it's like, This community, you could bring this community anything like, hey, I am a doctor. I've got like, you know, I think I'm set for life and maybe, you know, my next life and three other lifetimes, but I'm scared. you know. (laughs) And the things I want to do, I don't know how to do these things, but I want to do A, B and C. And then somebody, 15 people come on and they say, hey, you know, like I know how to do A, B and C. And hey, I tried, you know, I left as a doc and I did. And suddenly you're, you don't have to, everything in our society, this is such a me or you world so it's basically the first fear is overcoming the fear of reaching out and making yourself a bit vulnerable and you know when anybody asks you a question you feel so great because you have an answer you know and so you're giving people a gift of your vulnerability not your helplessness but your vulnerability you're sort of like i have a dream for myself but i'm not sure i can do it where we think people are heroes because they figure it out themselves and they do it all by themselves and that is not heroic that is like impoverished to me that's poverty that's poverty and fear is to be so isolated that you try to do everything yourself so i think you have a great community and i think this community could help each other in that courageous move you know, it's like, I remember they, in, in fire, they call it scaling the wall of fear, you know, and doing the jump. Yeah. But for yeah. me, for me, that's doing that jump. Part of what lets you do it is, is having a passion for something greater than, you know, it's not just, I want to learn that skill, but I want to learn that skill because I want to be a great dad and I want to have kids someday. I want to learn that skill because I want to be able to like be in a training. I want to learn that skill because I would like to you know, drive around the world. And I think I better be able to fix my own engine if I'm out in the middle of the toolies. It's like, you want the skill, but you want the skill for something. So the, you know, I, you know, sort of like have your own, how to have a dream thing. Yeah. Um, We talked about that earlier with Michael Santos. Santos. I mean, it seems, seems, you know, his whole, his whole prison reform is not just about him. It's about this greater, he's, he's got this thing he wants to do to bring to the world. I don't mean to glorify myself, but I invest in us winning. I invest in the world winning. I invest in sustainability and in beauty and in love. And that's what keeps me going. (laughs) OG, we we unfortunately are running out of time, but OG, do you have a question? I've got a couple great ones too, that are in the, from the community. I'm just enjoying listening to everything. I, 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 the, the biggest thing that I heard was, you know, Focus on the things that you really want to do. Focus on the things and invest in the things that you believe in. And um, and that really is such a great message. That's the only, it's not really a question. It's more of a, more of a comment. So thank yeah. you. It, it was, yeah. it was, it was, it was so powerful to me. I remember when I, Vicki was first introduced to your book and I had, I had just come off of trading money for, for, for time doing a job that I liked, but I didn't love. And I just realized that I'm not going to be here forever. And I need to start chasing those things that I love instead of chasing, um, you know, just another dollar that I can waste on something that I probably don't need. I like this question from Jay. I, I love a lot of the questions, unfortunately, but this one, What's the most, you know, you talked about. Can I do one thing? I just want to do a shout out. Um, uh, Michelle uh, Wig at frugalityandfreedom.com is here. God bless. Michelle works with me on my podcast and she is amazing. And you can't have her as your staff because she's. (laughs) Okay. So. She she, uh, she was asking, by the way, if the cat was going to make a uh, an appearance, and and it and it happened. Um, uh, J H has a great question. When you were talking about all these different skills, what's the most useful, enjoyable life skill that you learned that helped you live on so little per much? So, of all those skills, was it repair? I bet it was repairing the engine. Learning how to work on your engine was probably. The- I can't work on my car anymore. It's a computer. It's an electric <laughs> car. Uh, yeah, I would say. Uh, housekeeping is certainly not my, my skill. 
<laughs> there's a world of sin behind the screen. Um, I think actually cooking from scratch is is a fundamental skill that a lot of people have lost. And I noticed that when I did my food bat book that people cannot approach the idea of resourcing their lives locally because they don't know what to do with the turnip. Mm. You know, so I think basically cooking from scratch is an important skill and there's a lot to that, you know, and, and um, what other skill? And I think comparison shopping and I is an important skill. Things don't cost what they cost, they cost what you pay. And so that turned me into a thrift store shopper um, and a library, you know, basically the skill of really asking. And then another skill is um, what is the need? I want an item. And what is the need this item is filling? And can I fill that need in another way? Because most things we buy, we're trying to buy some things we buy, like I just got a new refrigerator. You know, that I, I like I can't like improvise a refrigerator. I could try, you know, like leaving things outside in a covered thing, not protected from the squirrels. Um, but a lot of things we buy represent something else. It could represent status or um, you know, self-respect or treating myself or retail therapy or whatever. You know, you just think about it. Every time you're gonna click on Amazon or any of those online shopping things, you know. What are you doing? What do you really want? Because not only are you, you're not depriving yourself, you're discovering yourself. Because why don't you live the life you really want? You know, if you're buying something and you realize I'm buying it because I'm lonely, then maybe you should invest some time in other things, like meeting people that who might share your you know, there's very risky things in life about loving and 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 showing up for things. You know, you, you might buy a T-shirt, you know, like Black Lives Matter T-shirt. But what you really want to do is be engaged in the major issues of the times. And you don't know how. So you buy the T-shirt. So if you ask yourself at that T-shirt moment, what do I really want? You have... You're, you're headed into a much more rewarding and probably much more difficult journey of significance and meaning in your life. So, you know, that sort of cooking, <laughs> critical thinking, um, you know, comparison shopping and uh, those sorts of things, I think are... And community, yeah. Well, totally. Yeah. And yeah. it's so risky, you know, our hearts are just so damaged and wounded by this life, you know, and we spend way too much time on money and too little time on the, the social in connection. But that's what's most important. That's the perfect place right there to call it a night. That's like the, the statement. <laughs> Fantastic. Vicki Robin, thanks so much for hanging out with us. I appreciate it so much. People can hear your podcast. What could possibly go right, by the way? second best name podcast of all time there's there's only one that might might be better vicky but thanks for hanging out and of course your books are available everywhere i assume correct they are and in libraries absolutely <laughs> vicky thanks a ton for hanging out with us i really appreciate it yeah you're so welcome thank you for inviting me what a fun group of people to hang out with we're just entertaining ourselves vicky that's all we're that's all we're doing exactly i mean i love this fire community because i love that it's a bunch of really smart people who like to decode things and not just you know just not just take the meal that's served to them but just you know create create a life that they want so I, I, thank you. Great conversations. I, I, I'm with you. Fantastic. And, and it's so inquisitive. Somebody said that in the comments. People so inquisitive and always learning, and it's it's phenomenal. But thanks a ton for hanging out with us. Vicky, You're so welcome. Vicky Robin, everybody. Man, that was that was incredible, wasn't it? It always is with Vicky. It, it, it as well is. as Michael and Dan. I just rounded off the conversation perfectly. I just love the fact that we had three different conversations, OG, three different conversations with three distinctly different individuals, but really had some solid themes that resonated through all three of our guests tonight. 
That sounds like a tee up for some sort of theme that I'm supposed to have written down. <laughs> Discriminate to everyone right now. We're going to get to that in a little bit. That's coming in. That's coming in it just a second. Fantastic. I mean, give me a break. This, this stuff is uh, all of these people, like you said, completely different in terms of their perspective, but all with the same message, which is be who you are and you get to control what tomorrow is. And just, just such a, a wonderful way to listen to three different stories. Yeah, I love it. Uh, in just a second, we're going to have our takeaways, but let's talk about what's going on where where you two guys live. We'll start off with uh, Doc G. What's coming up at the Earn and Invest podcast, my friend? Well, we are doing panels as usual on Mondays and individual interviews on Thursdays. We had Chris Hogan on this Monday. So that was yesterday. And we talked about everyday millionaires as well as it was our two year anniversary at earn and invest. It's so amazing. I was interviewed by Jennifer Ma and we had a great interview there. And Thursday is going to be a special veterans day episode made up of our community members. So it's really going to be a community focused episode. That, that's fantastic. And that's at the Earn Invest podcast, where finer podcasts, wherever finer podcasts are distributed. EarnandInvest.com. Bobby, um, <laughs> Bobby, what do you and I have coming up at, uh, at Money with Friends? We are talking on Wednesday's show about quarantine purchases that people regret. I would love to, I, I would love to know what, what Vicki would have to say about some of the things that people have spent money on that they kind of go, mm, you know, maybe I'm not going to be knitting as much as I aspire to at the beginning of it. So we got a lot, we did a lot of audience um, participation on that episode. Um, we had Elizabeth Seagran from Fast Company, also the author of The Rocket Years, was our co-host and she really brought it. She actually came in a, in a quarantine purchase that she did not regret. There was, I learned there's a, uh, a dress called the Nap Dress by a place called Hill House that was a huge um, Instagram fat where it's so comfortable you can work from home in it and then you can just take a nap and it's it's that comfortable you can take a nap in it. I, of course, Vicky would not be pleased to hear this, right after the episode went to go buy my nap dress and they were sold out. So I was saved from myself. I don't, I, I would love to get a nap dress. I'm probably on the waiting list. I'm sure the cookies will find me and I will eventually have a nap dress like Liz but uh, it's a really fun episode. And over on Financial Grown Up, I have um, Rachel Rogers, who when everyone was downsizing during the pandemic, she and her family moved from a normal house to uh, a 50 plus acre ranch. Holy cow. So they're building out a ranch. Now they just built the, they bought the property next door. Wow. So they upsized when everyone downsized. And she talks a lot about, you know, when to take risk. Um, when everyone else is kind of pulling back, she talks about go big. And Rachel Rogers, her company is Hello7. She's terrific. Great episode. I'm really proud of it. We, we've heard that theme multiple times. Jason Harris, who's with us on, on Money with Friends, also talked about doing that with your advertising. And, uh, you know, uh, David Bach is with us. Farnoosh Charabi is with us. Uh, Grant Sabatier with us over there at Money with Friends. OG, any, any big plans tonight as soon as we get done with this? You, dinner waiting for you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Dinner's waiting for me. All right. That's how we come out here. <laughs> well, let's, well, let's, l let's wrap this thing up. We're not good at this ending thing. So everybody got your little uh, script in front of you. <laughs> everybody ready? <laughs> All right, here we go. Guys, what should we have learned tonight? So from Dan Chan, we learned that branding is everything. Why be the millionaire magician when you can be the billionaire magician? Aim high, my friends. All right. Second, how about for Michael Santos? You can't change the future or think you can't change the future. Wrong. You can. Good life. Great life. Great money habits. Start when you decide that you want to do that. Or maybe this advice from our friend Vicki Robin, invest in your community and you'll never be impoverished. But the big lesson, who needs Doug? We got this, guys. We did it without him. Bam. Normally, we'd have the rest of our credits here. First of all, big thank you to Dan Chan for blowing Bobby in my mind, um, for reading Bobby's mind. I've been her co-host for over a year now. I'm still trying to read her mind. Dan Chan does it in like 10, 15 minutes. No idea. <laughs> big, th big thanks also to Michael Santos. You can find his story at Million Stories. Check out his face plant video. It's fantastic. And michaelsantos.com and Prison Professors. And, of course, 
Vicki Robin, and you'll find Vicki Robin's podcast, What Could Possibly Go Right, wherever you're listening to this podcast, and Vicki Robin's phenomenal book, Your Money or Your Life, wherever, wherever you get books. So thanks a lot, everybody, for hanging out with us. That's a wrap. Bye, everybody. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens in the after show stays in the after show. And I know from your comments that we have some new people here that haven't been with us for a while. And um, we've been talking about OG that we got to go back and reboot. In fact, at our team meetings and Doc, you've sat through our team meetings. We've talked about how we got to talk about our philosophy we got to talk about our, we got to have a trailer. Doc G's telling us we have to have a trailer. Bobby, you and I don't even have a trailer for money with friends. We got to get a trailer. Apparently, do we put the trailer out back? Is that where we put the trailer? <laughs> That's where Doug stays. Yeah. It's like, the, it's like the start here button for, you know, on the, you know, the website said a little start here thing. We need like a start here so you can get caught up on the kind of all yes. the highlights of like, here's this inside story. Here's what it came from. Here's what the joke is. And so then when you hear it, you, you're kind of caught up. And I do know we have some classic stories that we talk about all the time, but we haven't told in a long time. Yeah. So um, for those of you that have been around a, a while, you're going to have to hear them again just so people can catch up. Because we seem to, we didn't mean to keep telling these stories or reference them over and over. They we just, just only have so many stories. They, right. <laughs> <laughs> we got so much material. We've had a thousand episodes. We, we've got to grow some new material. Um, but, but a couple of the classic stories, I think... I drew the short straw, right? So I'm going first. Yeah, whatever. A couple of classic stories. One is um, uh, uh, my son back in the, I didn't even know, Bobby, if you've heard this story. Have you heard the story about my, my kids on the swim team? I know nothing. No? So, so, so my kids are on the swim team and, and the swim team at Texas high, by the way, Texarkana has two, two big, there's four high schools in town, but there's two big high schools, mm -hmm. Texas high. And guess what the other one's called Arkansas high. Cause it's right on the border. So those, mm -hmm. those two schools fight with each other. Um, but my, my son and my daughter on the Texas high swim team, when they were a freshman and they were a sophomore, their practice started at five 30 in the morning. So I would have to get my <laughs> lazy butt out of bed at 5 AM to drive them to practice. Now the cool thing is, is that there ended up later on being, being a, a neighbor kid that would drive them part way, but I had to drive them to the neighbor kid's house and then they would drive the rest of the way. So 5 a.m. every day, get out of bed. Well, you can believe the second, the second my kids turned 16, they were driving themselves to practice. Immediate, there was no better day in my life than the day that my kids turned 16. It was absolutely phenomenal. And so it's been maybe three months later and uh, Cheryl and I are fast asleep at 540 and my son comes walking downstairs to our bedroom. Our house was on a hill and said, dad, mm -hmm. I, I, uh, uh, dad, I, th and, and this is my favorite quote of all time, dad, I think there's something wrong with the car. And so I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll go take a look at it. So I go upstairs and on the way up, I'm like, I'm like, what's wrong? Won't it start? He goes, no, it started. And I said, well, is it, it is it, did it die? He goes, no, no. Well, kind of, but, but, it, but, but not really die. I go upstairs and my son has 
mounted, mounted the car on my neighbor's mailbox. <laughs> I have no idea how the hell he did it. Like, like here is, let's say that my little can of Spindrift is the, is the mailbox. The car is sitting right here. The mailbox, how the hell... <laughs> What is Spindrift, by the way? I have it's 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 like fizzy water stuff. Hmm. So anyway, um, oh boy. So sorry, sorry to change the tune here. Anyway, so so, so I'm wondering how the hell did he even do it? It turns out that my daughter had left a CD on full blast. And he starts up the car and the CD's going full blast and he starts going up the driveway and he's trying to take the CD out at the same time. And he decides to, uh, he decides he needs to hit the brake and he accidentally hits the gas. He floors it, mm. hits the, hits the mound in the middle of the street, gets airborne, <laughs> Jesus, takes out the whole damn, takes out the whole damn mailbox. That's actually not the funny. The funnier part of the story is so, so a few minutes. So, so we go call a wrecker. And the wrecker's like, so, so, uh, 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 what's going on? I'm like, well, uh, my car is on a mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, so what do you mean by on a mailbox? Like, I mean, I mean, it's on a, he, he goes, you hit a mailbox. I'm like, no, no wheels are touching the ground. Not one wheel is touching the ground. <laughs> so then my neighbors come out. <laughs> and my my neighbors are standing there, and they're like, uh, 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 "So what happened here, man? How'd your son hit Jim's mailbox?" <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> and they all think, and they all think he's drunk, right? <laughs> th th they totally think it's some drunk thing. And I'm like, "Nope, on his way to swim practice. Probably not completely awake, but but also also not 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 a drinking and driving story." The best part though was the. Uh, the <laughs> dude who drove the the dude comes out with the with the uh wrecker and he stops right next to it and he goes <laughs> and then and then he takes out his camera and he goes yeah i just got to take a couple pictures of this to to make and you know he's not taking pictures for the dude he's totally like, funny got on he's like, insta stories this whole damn thing's going on facebook look at what this moron did and uh yeah not a not a not a great night but it, but that all started with there's something wrong with the car so so in our in our family whenever there's something wrong with the car that's code for yeah. it might be might be a bad time Joe, my son just turned 16 and got his driver's license. So now you got me all freaked out. I'm sorry. Cameron's a good kid, though. He's a, he's a great kid. I don't know if you want me to out his name, and I just did. Yeah, okay. So I'm no, sorry. Fine, yeah. Anyway, uh, Cameron, by the way, also edits edits the Earn and Invest podcast. Invest podcast. He does. And he's does a, it. I don't know how he does this. He edits an hour episode in 30 minutes. What? He does. He puts it on like two or three times and edits it. I don't. And he uses Descript. I don't know how he does this. Oh my. But it comes out pretty darn good. That's good. We, we got to pay him less. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bobby, you've had kids that are drivers. Actually, funny story. We don't. I wish they would drive. They don't drive. No, no one drives. So I have a 24-year-old and a 21-year-old stepchildren, and they have no interest in driving. Um, Harry is 13 and a half. He will likely be the first one to drive. New Yorkers. Seriously. And I'm listening. I Yeah, I know. New but she Yorkers. went to school in Indiana. We all <laughs> thought she would get her license in Indiana. But she was like, it was awesome. I was never the designated driver. Why would I get my license? Right? Yeah, duh. Just what you want to hear your kids say. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Great. Um, look, she's a New York City kid. That was the least of our issues. So, um yeah, but uh, I love that story because I'm just going to roll it out and play it for Neil every time he reminds me of some of the uh, <laughs> the, the, th the things that have happened with our car, with me. <laughs> we don't, of of this, car. we do not speak. Yeah, there, there have been things with the wrong car when, yeah, yes, I, I think we don't need to share them. Richie, our producer. Been, you know. Our producer, Richie situation. guys, who's hanging out with us has, has, knowing that we're all podcasters, he's thinking about our segue. Uh, but you know what I love when my son hits the neighbor's mailbox, a nice can of Spindrift. Your first order is twenty percent <laughs> if you go to spindrift.com forward slash. Love it. That's pretty good. 
That was pretty good. Spindrift, if you want to sponsor the show, Joe at StackyBenjamins.com. But OG <laughs> has, has, I think, a better story. Uh, we talk a lot about the Steak Brother story. So uh, yeah. we're only at two hours so far. I think we got to go a little longer. <laughs> so tired. We're we going to let this one go? Let's just let it go, and we'll do it next time. We'll do it later. We can do it now. It's okay. Okay. All right. Bring I mean, it. It's up to you guys. It's a special I night. I don't care. Bobby's I mean, looking at us like, please let me go. <laughs> This one's pretty good. You'll well, get, no, I just, like I just, too. yeah. Well, we're not going to talk about the fact that my dad's driveway was very dark for a while. Oh, it had little lights around it, you know, little things. So m- yeah. m- might have scratched a car there's or so two. Many, there's a lot of stories, but a little bit. you know, this, there's a reason we live in urban areas and we don't drive very often. That's okay. Can always blame the Uber driver. So my, um, uh, when my daughter. I think it must have been when Caroline was born, right? She was little. Was this was this about four years ago now, I think? I would think so, yeah. So my mom was in town. My brother lives here in Dallas or used to live here in Dallas with his wife. And um, mom's in town, so we're going to go to the nice steakhouse in town. Now in Dallas, there's about a thousand of them, but we have our favorite. And and we get this nice table and, and we're seated at this uh, just kind of nice spot in the restaurant, order a bottle of wine. We've got the cocktails going, the appetizers, everything's fantastic. And uh, the waiter comes over and says, uh, would you like to, uh, can I tell you a little bit about the menu? Now we've been there a couple of times. I already know what I want. Like I don't change when I go to Subway, I get the same sub every time. <laughs> I never try anything different. I, it's because I know what works. This I is know so what's you. Be good. This I know, is like, so you. <laughs> decision fatigue. I don't ever get it. Cause I never make decisions. It's already, already set in stone. But, uh, but then he's talking about, he's like, well, let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the stuff that's on the menu. And, and so he's going through and, and he's talking about the, you know, this type of, we've got these lamb chops and we have, you know, this roasted uh, chicken that's fantastic. And, you know, with all this, all this accoutrement. And then we've got this, uh, uh, our, our steak special of the day is a, uh, is a, a ribeye and it comes with some, you know, some Himalayan sea salt and, and, you know, it's finished, you know, with this, you know, blah, 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 blah. How do you He's know it's Himalayan out. by the way? I just got to point that out when they say Himalayan sea salt, I'm like, prove to me that it came from the Himalayas. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll actually tell you something about a different, a different <laughs> restaurant, different place. But anyways, so, uh, so we'll go through, we go through, we all go around the, the, the table. Mom gets like whatever she wants and then it goes around and my brother says, you know, I had the, uh, the steak special. I said, okay. And I order my food. When you're at a nice place, sometimes if they do a good job, they serve everyone at the same time, right? That's the kind of how they're supposed to do it. So they serve everybody except my brother and he's not getting, he doesn't get his food. And so, you know, you're supposed to wait. So we all just kind of sit there for a second and we're waiting. And then here comes his special. And it's like, it's like at a club, you know, when you order the bottle of vodka and they come out with like the champagne and it's the sparklers and everybody's super excited. That's what's going on with this steak. It's like literally on fire. And you're already at a high end steakhouse. Yeah, yeah, it's on fire. It's 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 you know it's really great, and uh, and they they present it to him. Just put this thing down in front of him. They're like, ta-da, the special, you know. So he he's he's you know carving into this thing. He's like, this is the greatest piece of meat I've ever had. Like this is fantastic. It's cooked perfectly. It's, it's, it's magnificent. I stole a little a little bite. He's not lying. It was really good. So so then we get the uh, uh, so then we have dinner or desserts and stuff like that. Uh, the bill comes and this is the funny part because, because uh, I kind of knew what I was in for because we're, you know, we're at this place that I've been to before, but I didn't know that I was in for this. So I get the, I get the, you know, the, the waiter hands you the little thing and you kind of do the little glance like, Oh crap. I got to work a lot of overtime for this one. And <laughs> you got to trade a lot of life. You got to trade a lot. Do a little, yeah, big I, old I Vicky lot, Robin trade. I got a lot of life to trade for this meal. <laughs> And, um, uh, and so, so I just look at my brother and I just shake my head and he goes, Oh, was it expensive? And I said, what do you think they mean when they say special? And he said, <laughs> he's like, Oh, it's like the stuff that's on sale. And I'm like, no, 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 no it's not blue light special. We're not at Kmart. And so then I slide it over to him and his face turns pale white as he kind of goes down the list and he's like, okay, you know, cocktail, eight bucks, salad, eight dollars. Oh, that's my favorite. 
<laughs> and you can see him like trying to, he's starting to panic a little bit. He's like, what do I do? Like, are we splitting this? Like who's paying for this? <laughs> and, and so I just kind of let that, just let this simmer for a second. I mean, you know, this is a 20, probably a 27 year old or 26 year old who just ate like what you, you could probably buy a quarter of a cow. <laughs> all into your, into your freezer for what this one piece of steak was. And, 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 uh, anyways, so, so, so what would everybody do? What would you do, Joe, if that were the case, if you, you were, you're at a dinner, you didn't realize what you did. Would you, would you throw in a little bit? I, how, how would you, I, I would throw in as much as I possibly could beg forgiveness, yeah. wash your car maybe, for a week, maybe pick up the tip. Go, Hey, I maybe. Got Yes. You know, I'm going to take, I'd this. excuse myself for the bathroom and then disappear. <laughs> Dine and dash. Right. There's a lot of ways out of that, that, that give you a little grace, Bobby. Gotta go. Of- uh, credit card, credit card roulette. Oh, yeah, credit yeah, card roulette. Put, I'm going to put, I'm gonna put 20 on this one. Uh, I'm going to go 60 no, 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 on this no, that's one. No, 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 that's not what it, what credit, oh. so, so no, 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 no. What it is, is you like, uh, um, uh, you basically, it's like you pick numbers and, and whoever gets the, you know, wrong number pays for the whole thing. Oh, yeah, that was it's never like going to happen. I could have won a thousand. Yeah, like times you, in you a row. put all. I'm sorry, you put all the credit cards in, and you like put them around, and you know somebody yes. like picks out the credit card, and that's the person that pays for it. Oh, yeah, yeah, that would. I yeah, lost that's that a that's anyway. a fun New York City game, <laughs> party so. game in New York City. <laughs> so, my, my 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 brother would have been like, they, they would have just come back and said, "Sir, it didn't work. Try your it's game again." Uh, new 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 game. So uh, so anyway, so that's the Steak Brothers story. Uh, my brother paid for zero of it. He got the complete like t- alligator arms, you know, like, Oh, I would love to help, but I can't reach T-Rex. my wallet from up here. T-Rex. Yeah, exactly. T-Rex arms. He's like, were you treating originally? Like, was it your dinner? It was my dinner. Okay. Um, but, 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 you know, I mean, when everyone else's meal is $40 and his was like closer to 175, <laughs> you, there's a small, small discrepancy mm-hmm, in, mm-hmm. <laughs> in the ratio of you know the budget when you when you kind of do your budget for you, you know did he thank you uh yeah yeah i mean he probably said thanks yeah yeah he's still not a memorable is, thank you no not at all no you still can get him back just make him take you out to dinner next time don't worry about it i i've, I've got my plans i'm glad that plans. i'm glad that we could catch new people up on those two stories because we talk about them all the time but um this is also why i love going to dinner with og because i know that i can order a little extra and he's already been conditioned <laughs> the steak steak brothers way up here so i'll just go if ahead and order a little dessert like 135 you are in i'm fine yep. at least i'm not steak brother you're not steak brother 